pleasure for me coming across for all sorts of reasons. One of the great, one of the reasons it's been a great pleasure for me is that um, reconnecting with Surya, who was one of my wonderful uh, doctoral students um, from India that I've had over the years, truly talented, exceptional individual who did wonderful work on the basic structure doctrine and done wonderful work on other areas of Indian law and constitutional law since then. So without more ado, Sudhir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, uh, for the gracious introduction. And um, so I, I, my first project, as Paul uh, said, was on the basic structure doctrine. And I, I was lucky that I had Paul as a supervisor who kept me on the rails. And the second project that I'm working on is what I'm going to be talking uh, about this, this afternoon is on the directive principles, and I've had to do this without a supervisor, and it's taken longer in some ways than it should have. Um, and what I'm, what I'm going to do this afternoon is to present a very small part of a book-length project. I know that Professor Singh, who's here, has heard one version of this paper, which is about uh, the content of directive principles. Uh, and let me just get into the, the details of the book project and put up some useful text that all of us can work with uh, before I get into the uh, part that I want to focus on, which is on the relationship between institutions, which is the theme for this panel. Um, so most people in this room know that the Indian Constitution puts in place a chapter uh, that deals with directive principles. Uh, what is less well known is that the directive principles chapter is uh, possibly the most enduring uh, unsolved puzzle in the Indian constitution. It's, it's a source of a majority of the amendments of the constitution. Again, something that's not, not often noticed. It's also the source of some of the most important cases in Indian constitutional law, starting right from 1950, but maybe 1973 and Kesha Nanda. Um, is, is, a, is a good place to start, where the directive principles were central to what was going on in that case. And it was in some sense that while I was doing the first project on the basic structure doctrine, I realized that the entire story from 1950 to 1973 had this background uh, doctrinal and political tussle uh, that needed to be solved. Clearly, it was beyond the pale of that project, and I, I turn to that now. Um, I think that the, base, the, the place of directive principles is use, can be usefully thought of as, as asking of us three important questions. First, some account of the content of these principles. What are these principles? You know, is, are these principles the same as rights? Is there any, is there any real difference between a socio-economic right to education and a principle that says that education Compulsory education should be provided. Does it make a difference? Uh, does it matter that you call directive principles principles of justice? And it, should principles of justice be in a constitution? Is this a disparate or a unified set of principles? Are they all animated by a master principle or a master idea? Or should we just see them as a sort of disparate set pulled together by historical accident, as many constitutional uh, compromises are. Uh, that part of the presentation, um, and, and, I mean, that part of the, this question I've, I've answered elsewhere, and as these things go, now everything is up on YouTube, even before you thought, of, uh, thought through the question carefully enough, you're, you're holding out on all these things. So I'm not going to say anything more about uh, what the directive principles as a chapter could be characterized as. I think a second important part is, uh, is an account of the relationship between directive principles and fundamental rights. This is, to my mind, and I was, had the pleasure of discussing this with Professor Bakshi this morning, I think the most original contributions to in, in Indian constitutional scholarship so far have been done on this question, on what is the relationship between fundamental rights guaranteed by courts, and directive principles which are made non-enforceable by courts. What, so, so does that establish a sort of priority 
of one over the other, and I could just set up a simple typology to explore this. Are directed principles and fundamental rights coordinate in status? Are they of the same normative status? Are directed principles superior to fundamental rights? Are they inferior to sub or subordinate to fundamental rights? And these questions have, uh, like I've said, animated Indian constitutional law for, for the last 60 years. And they haven't gone away. I mean, post-90s, we have another version uh, of these debates, which I'm not going to spell out. So in the book, I have actually spent a lot of time, and I'm just putting up a, a, a preliminary draft table of contents. I was complaining to Alison that as I worked more, the table of contents keeps changing. Uh, but take it for what it is. I've looked very carefully at how directive principles have been implemented. Which agency of government implements it? Does it matter when the executive acts on a directive principle? Does it matter when a legislature acts, acts on a principle? What is the nature of the conflict and how should courts uh, resolve these questions? And, and I've traversed the literature and, uh, and there's excellent literature in this field. Uh, but I'm not going to say too much about that either today. I'm going to focus on what I think is the third uh, important question when we think about uh, the place of directive principles in the Constitution, which is to give an account of the institutional relationship between the political branches uh, of government, uh, and that's the legislature and the executive government, and the judicial branch, the courts. Now, this third institutional dimension of the problem is relatively unexplored. There, there is some work on this, and I'll, I'll refer to it as I go along. And I'm going to suggest that this is an important part uh, of, of unpacking what's going on in these, uh, in these cases. So in, to answer this institutional question, I'm going to take two tacks. The first is historical. I'll try to give, uh, share with you a brief account of the history behind thinking of this institutional relationship and how it came to be instantiated into the Constitution. And then I want to spend a little bit of time working through what the conceptual vocabulary that lies behind this, this institutional relationship. And I think that if we, if we make some progress here, uh, we might have a better account of what's going on with director principles in the Constitution. Um, so let me, let me get started. I, I just think that there's, there's, there are only two slides that I want to share with you uh, um, this, this afternoon. One is on Article 32 of the Constitution, which is in some ways the gateway to, to the fundamental rights chapter. And if, if, uh, if look at Article 32, Clause 2 carefully, you, you notice that the Supreme Court has a specific power to enforce. It doesn't use the language uh, of, it, it does use the language of enforcement, and it, it does specify with some greater clarity how this might be enforced, right? In, uh, Article 13 is relevant, but I won't drag you there. I just want you to look at Article 37 which is the gateway provision to the directive principles of, of state policy. Uh, I, I think this text is useful. By distinction to Article 32, Clause 2, there is no mandate of enforcement. There is, though, in fact, there is a bar to enforcement, not enforceable by any court, but nevertheless fundamental in the governance of the country, and in the making of laws. So you apply these principles. I think the word apply is important. You apply these principles in the making of laws. So this is the, the Constitution of India 1950, as we have it. And I think it's useful to, to try and work through some of the constitutional history as to why we have, uh, we have this, this particular phrasing, and how did we get to where we got to. The, I think Nietzsche Jayal's uh, book on um, citizenship and its discontents has a very powerful chapter on the history of the directive principles, chapter five, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, but the chapter exclusively focuses on the question as if it were a question between socioeconomic rights on the one hand and civil and political rights on the other. And she looks in some sense at, at the conflict between these two kinds of rights as the primary question in that history. 
I try and use that history, uh, it's, it's the broad layout of the history uh, in my paper, uh, but I don't look at the rights and social, uh, civil and political rights, social economic rights question. I want to focus on the institutional question. And this is how this history pans out. If we start with the Nehru report of 1928, we have uh, uh, an interesting chapter of, of the Nehru report which lists out rights, including the right to education and other social welfare rights bundled together with civil and political rights. No distinction is made between them. They, in fact, they're in the same clause of the Nehru report. This is the Nehru report of 1928, in some ways a proto-constitutional document. Uh, and what is interesting about the document is that it does not order any institutional priority in the enforcement of these rights. So all the rights are evenly placed, whether they be social and economic rights or civil and political rights, but none of them are enforceable. So there is no mandate for judicial review at all in the Nehru report. All you have is a jurisdiction to interpret the constitution. No specific right to end, no specific power on the courts to enforce any right whatsoever. The Karachi resolution doesn't talk about institutions either. What it does do, though, is it substitutes accounts of social rights by pushing, for an, uh, pushing it under the rubric of state ownership over various industries and various sectors of the economy. So in the next crucial political document, political slash constitutional document of the, of the independence movement, you see a, 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 a strong push for state ownership at, to replace any account of social rights or, or principles of justice. The third stage of this evolution is important, and really uh, the third stage is simply the Constituent Assembly debates and the committee processes that went along with the, with the, with the Constituent um, Assembly process. And I've got five minutes, so I better be uh, sharper and quicker about this. Okay. Um, in two memoranda are particularly important. Ambedkar. Ambedkar takes the view that state ownership or state socialism is the way to go with respect to welfare. Surprisingly, because he, I think he changes his mind by the time the constitution is, uh, is drafted in its final form. And, and Benegal Rao takes the view that the two, uh, that we should split civil and political rights on the one hand and uh, principles of, 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 of justice on the other, political justice on the other. This second view did not have any institutional account of who would be responsible for this divided chapter. It just had an account which rested on almost on the international debates on the, on the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which were happening at the same time. And India took the position that the rights should be split that we shouldn't have one universal declaration uh, which accommodated uh, Roosevelt's uh, four freedoms. So India's position was for a split uh, convention, and that position crept into constitution drafting. Now, I want to, I, I, let me, I just got enough time to quickly conclude, and let me try and then make four important points about how this panned out in the constituent assembly and in the debates. The first idea, is that all ought principles are simply not enforceable. And as Waldron puts it in a, in a very interesting article on social economic rights and uh, social justice, that ought is not can. So the, the, the fact that we might want to do many things uh, doesn't mean that it's, it, it's, it's practicable to do them. This was a strain of argument in, in, the, in the Constituent Assembly, echoed by many members, and at some, not by Ambedkar, but by several influential members, who thought that the reason we should, we should put some principles out into a, a separate chapter is because courts cannot enforce them. They can't be enforced in some immediate sense. The second institutional allocation uh, dimension that came up in the, in the debates is this idea that individuated case-type decision-making is good for courts to do. But collective decision-making, political, collective decision-making about the allocation of resources 
and uh, you know, but the distribution of resources are not decisions that the court can make. And hence, the political branches of government, the deliberative branch and the executive branch, should be the ones allocated that decision. The third idea that came up is that we cannot create a sham constitution where all the values of the constitution were so specified that there would be nothing left for the political process to do. And Ambedkar was very clear about this. He said these are principles of justice that admit of varied specification. And he, he was quite clear that India is not the USSR. And this was the specific counterpoint. So this was not going to be a socialist sham constitution. The fourth idea that, that they had was that they were not going to be perfectionist about these values either. You know? And Ambedkar, again, is the best, uh, has the most evocative account of this, which is that, you know, uh, the courts are good when values can be stated at a level of clarity that, they, they, that, that allows for application to individual cases. Now, there's a, there's a bit of a, I, I need to make more of a theoretical argument here about why principles are different in this respect. Uh, but given that I'm going to get the, the, the two minute and the, or the zero minute uh, timeline, I, I hope some of you will ask me that in questions. Uh, the, the important part, I think, is that what they're relying on is, is the clear idea that they will make a departure from Anglo-American constitutionalism, for sure. So Ambedkar's reference points are not the Soviet Union, but they're Rousseau and C.S. He goes back to an idea of Republican constitutionalism, but which is not purely collectivist. So there's this, there's this tension there in the way he articulates where to position this part, this chapter of the Constitution, and I think uh, that, that its roots are clearly in addressing the social question in the way that an early form of French constitutionalism tried to do. What does all this mean for courts? What unfortunately happened after 1950 is that whatever the value, of, these debates were not even argued in court. Uh, the Indian courts were immune to these kinds of historical or political theoretical questions. And so the court simply abdicated from any role with respect to the directive principles for a substantial period of time. That is not the argument that I am making. What I am suggesting is that the Constitution does two or three things very clearly. First, in the implementation of directive principles, it grants the deliberative branches and the executive branches a clear priority and finality over the meaning of the Constitution. Having said that, the, the courts still have at least two or three important roles. First, they need to, to, to draft these values into their general interpretation of the Constitution and their particular interpretation of the fundamental rights. One. Two, they have a secondary role of enforcement, which is that once the, the directive principles have been specified, either by statute or by executive action, they, like any other institution of state, as Article 37 suggests, must hold these principles to be fundamental in the governance of the country. And so they have an enforcement role, albeit a secondary one. I think overall, and I'll just say one sentence, Paul, uh, um, two sentences, uh, that uh, characterizing this institutional relationship is important. Is this just another version of political constitutionalism uh, in the way that someone like Adam Tompkins might argue? Is this some idea of uh, uh, a republican constitution, which might not republican in the narrow Sunstein style argument in the, in the US, Sunstein or Tashnet, but a republican in a French republican, uh, older constitutional tradition, are very important questions. While we, while we work through this institutional relationship. Let me start. Thank you. Surya, so, yeah, thank you very much indeed for a very stimulating presentation.
Thank you very much indeed. So without more ado, I'm going to pass on to um, Alison Young. Alison Young is a colleague of mine in Oxford. I'm privileged to teach with her. She is a gifted constitutional and administrative lawyer who has written many incisive works on aspects of both administrative and constitutional law and is working on what will I'm sure be a definitive book about inter-institutional dialogue. Thank you. As ever, Paul is, is, is too kind. I, I have lots in common with Sudhir in starting my academic work in Oxford and uh, the presentation that I'm about to give is from a book I'm almost completed. Hopefully we'll be able to complete soon. But I had the disadvantage of not being supervised by Paul, so I, I made up for that by hijacking one of his classes so I can co-teach with him, engage in extensive dialogue, surreptitiously borrow his ideas and present them as my own. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, and what I'd like to do is talk to you about uh, my work on, it's a book I'm working on called Democratic Dialogue, and this is looking at aspects of inter-institutional dialogue. And what I'd like to look at is trying to explain what this is, trying to explain why this may be valuable, and some of the problems that arise with democratic dialogues and conceptions of inter-institutional dialogue, just to kind of look at it from the context of whether this is something that would be interesting for the Indian constitution, whether it fits into ideas that you find within the Indian constitution. Just as an idea, if an, this is out there, is this something that relates to what's going on in India? And if so, is this something that might be interesting or useless in context of how you might apply this within the context of Indian constitutional law? And also, from my perspective, what can I learn from India about how inter-institutional dialogue might work there and what light will that throw on the work that you find in other areas. So I'm hoping that this will give us a great way of exchanging ideas with this framework of inter-institutional dialogue. So the starting point, what is it? Well, inter-institutional dialogue has been uh, discussed extensively in two separate little areas, both of which would appear to have quite frankly, not a lot to do with how India is as a particular country and its particular context. So one area in which inter-institutional dialogue has been discussed a lot is in what Stephen Garbaum refers to as Commonwealth models, or what uh, Janet Hebert refers to as parliamentary bills of rights. And these are areas where you have human rights protections, where the aim is in some way to, to design the protection of human rights to have a role for both the legislature and the courts to play in protecting human rights. So in Canada, you have the notwithstanding clause, which gives the ability of the legislature to enact legislating notwithstanding provisions of the constitution. And the idea is that this is some way, because the legislature are a way of saying, well, I don't think I like this particular constitutional judgment, or I want to enact this piece of legislation without it being compatible with these rights for five years, and then see what happens and maybe change it. So they have a way, a role of, of interacting. You also find this in other areas, so variations of models which have legislature and judiciary playing a role in protecting rights. You'll find in the UK, you'll find in uh, the state of Victoria and the Australian Capital Territories in Australia, and you'll find in New Zealand. So that this is why Stephen Garbham was termed the Commonwealth without recognising that India, a large part of the Commonwealth is, is not actually adopting this particular model, but it, it's seen as stemming from this kind of framework. Um, and that obviously, that doesn't appear to be relevant in a system where you have a strong constitutional protection of rights, where the role of the court does play a, protect, a role in protecting rights quite strongly and has a responsibility for enforcing human rights. But maybe it might be something that builds into Sadir's work about how these principles, these directed principles, work, maybe it might have something to say in that particular area. The other area where you find um, elements of dialogue uh, Paul Craig touched on in his earlier presentation, and this is where you're looking at inter-institutional dialogue between courts. So rather than being a discussion between courts and legislatures about how you protect human rights, this idea is as a, as a discussion between courts and other courts. And you find this in the European Union, where you have a supranational organisation, and you have what's argued to be dialogue, or wouldn't it be nice if instead of these courts arguing with each other and taking stances and using these ideas of external autochtony, if instead they just sat down with a nice cup of tea and talked to each other and came up with these principles that will work 
and they will all work well together. And the same kind of understanding is put with regard to the European Court of Human Rights, the example that Paul gave in his talk. Instead of having these courts arguing, wouldn't it be nice if they could in some way interact with each other and develop human rights that recognised the perspective of the European Court of Human Rights, but also recognised the perspectives of the different signatory states to this convention. And again, I presume another, another lovely cup of tea will be had, and they'll be discussing these principles and will come up with better ideas. Now, if I'm sounding slightly cynical, it's because it's often presented in this way as a great panacea. So you'll have lots of work that's done and will say, in human rights protections, there are some who argue we should have predominant legal protections, some who argue we should have predominant political. But look, look at us, along comes dialogue and it does both and that's great, end of story. Or there'll be some who argue in the European Court of Human Rights that it should all be national protections of rights and not supranational, or that it should be predominantly international and supranational and I know, why don't we talk to each other and have a dialogue and this will resolve this tension. So it often gets presented as some kind of cure-all. So it comes with a great word of caution. And what I wanted to do in my work is to kind of take that question and say, well, it's all very well saying, let's have these institutions talking to each other in dialogue and this will resolve all these great problems. The question then becomes, well, what specifically do we mean by dialogue? Why could it be valuable? And what types of dialogue do we need to have to achieve these values? So to understand dialogue, we need to take it further and say, well, OK, if it is going to this great cure-all, our second point, what benefits particularly can dialogue bring? Why do we want to encourage interinstitutional dialogue to resolve these problems? And the main argument that is given in the human rights field is that if we have the legislature and the judiciary working together, then this will help us in particular to get a better resolution of rights. And by better, we mean not just in terms of we might be more able to understand what the right means in its context and get it right, but we also mean it might be more legitimate. It will be a much more legitimate way of resolving these situations, these um, difficulty, difficult applications of human rights if we have input from courts with their particular reasoning skills and input from legislatures which no, don't just have different reasoning skills but also have their own form of legitimacy. So we have democratically legitimate input from the legislatures and we have judicial independence and a reasoning input coming in from the judiciary and this will give us a better resolution of rights and a much more legitimate resolution of rights. So the idea is if they pull together, it's like two heads are better than one, pull your resources, use your specific different institutional skills, work together and you're much more likely to get a better understanding of what these rights are and a more legitimate understanding of what these rights are. But there are other advantages that are given for having inter-institutional dialogue, not just that we're more likely to get rights right, but we also argue it's a good way of having what we call checks and balances in practice. So it's also another way of thinking about the separation of powers and how we implement it and how we want it to work. So we could look at it and say, we don't just want these institutions to be kept separate, we do want them to also perform their own particular powers and make sure that the other institutions are taking powers away from them in some way. So sometimes dialogue is seen as a way of implementing a form of check and balance. And you particularly get this in the context that Paul was talking about earlier this morning. So the argument that gets made with regard to the um, European Union Court of Justice and the different member states is if we have this kind of element of checks and balances, we can make sure that the Court of Justice is not expanding too greatly and creating an autonomous area of law that is intruding too greatly on domestic law because we, the domestic courts, can look at these judgments and we can say, well, we also have a say in how you implement EU law. It's part of our law that tells you how you implement it. And if we think you're going too far, we can keep a check on you and so we can sort of push back in some way. So some of the points that the some of the examples of Paul's discussion in area can also be put in this light of inter-institutional, I think more interaction than dialogue. They aren't necessarily talking to each other, but they're kind of checking and pushing back against each other. And the argument is, as well as having these checks and balances in clashes, it'd be a nice idea for them to work together to eliminate some of these clashes, get a better understanding, whilst at the same time keeping a check on each other's powers. 
So this is another separate argument that's given. The other argument she's given as to why this might be a good idea builds on these checks and balances. And it says, well, democratic dialogue can perform a kind of pressure valve function. If we have inter-institutional dialogue, instead of there being a series of constitutional crises and conflicts and misunderstandings and a kind of antagonism, if institutions are encouraged to kind of work together in some way, then hopefully we will smoothly transition between one particular understanding of the Constitution towards another particular understanding of the Constitution. So, if you, again, bring an example from the UK and the European Court of Human Rights, there's currently a discussion in the UK amongst one particular political party, the Conservative Party, about whether well, we should replace the Human Rights Act with a British Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, which will make decisions of the European Court of Human Rights advisory only. And a lot of this concern is this idea of wanting to say these are our rights. And we, so rather than saying we well, don't have a political conflict, wouldn't it be better if the courts interacted with each other? So the national courts could say, well, these decisions are guiding, we understand these principles, but you haven't quite understood how it works in our particular system in this particular way. This is our understanding, this is what we think you should be doing. And the courts can learn from each other and hopefully smooth away these tensions. This idea is we'll have this great pressure valve. You get further arguments as well that all these discussions and interaction can further deliberative democracy. If you have reasons and justifications and they're published to the people at large, they can get involved in these constitutional discussions and all these wonderful things will happen. It's also argued that it could be more descriptively accurate. When you look at constitutions and look at their constitutional provisions, you don't really understand the reality of how constitutions work unless you also take a step back and say, well, over time, as well as there being different judgments, is there also a different context of inter-institutional interaction going on there that gives better descriptive accuracy of understanding what's going on in our constitution? So it sounds great, sounds wonderful, fantastic. How do you get it? Well, to achieve all this, um, my book is arguing, you need two distinct types of dialogue. On the one hand, you need dialogue mechanisms that look at maintaining what I call constitutional parity. You're not going to achieve all these advantages if one institution always wins. Or as Paul so nicely put it to me over lunch, the dialogue can't be one party always says, yes, dear. That, that's not going to work. That's not dialogue. There's no real interaction. There's no ability to interact properly. So there need to be some mechanisms of making sure that one institution doesn't always win. And there also needs to be other mechanisms to encourage what I call constitutional collaboration, where the institutions are encouraged in some way to work together. And this is where it becomes difficult, and this is where the potential problems might lie. If you have a system where you do have a strong constitutional protection of rights, you can facilitate constitutional collaboration, but the mechanisms you have to use normally involve either being quite antagonistic, so either the legislature has to turn around and say, well, I know this is what you've said, but I'm going to reenact this piece of legislation, more or less taking account of what you've said as to why it might be constitutionally incorrect, but actually not really. Or the collaboration might involve one of the institutions not necessarily exercising its powers fully. So these are the arguments that you find in the American system, this idea of judicial minimalism, that the court should say, well, I'm not really, I don't necessarily agree with this constitutional interpretation, but it's reasonable, so there's no real need for me to strike it down. And by saying it's reasonable, I'm giving the legislature their kind of say and their choice, a wider choice of legislative measures that are constitutionally compatible. And the difficulty with all these mechanisms is it relies on institutions accepting this is what they should be doing with these powers and acting in a way differently from how they might be used to acting. So if all these advantages of democratic dialogue are going to work, then particularly in a system with strong constitutional protection of rights, it requires the actors in the institutions to reimagine their roles and to have a different understanding of what the constitution is for and a different understanding of how the separation of powers operates. And that's where it becomes difficult. As you say, if you take a horse to what you can't make it drink. You can spend hours saying, wouldn't dialogue be lovely, wouldn't it be great? But if the attitude of institutional actors doesn't change, it isn't necessarily going to achieve all its objectives. 
It's not to say that institutional uh, dialogue is a complete disaster and should be avoided at all costs because it never actually achieves it. And to try and show this, I just want to conclude by giving an example of where what might seem to be an antagonistic form of dialogue with different institutions protecting their powers can actually, as a knock-on consequence, achieve collaboration almost indirectly. And this is the example of dialogue between the European Court of Human Rights and the UK courts in the, um, with regard to life sentences. So the decision of the European Court of Human Rights which is Binta and the United Kingdom, which didn't say you couldn't have life sentences, although that was how a lot of the media and a lot of political organisations reported it. What it did say very carefully was that if you are going to have life sentences, there has to be some kind of procedure, some process that allows prisoners, after serving a certain period of time, to be able to argue this life sentence is no longer suited to me on penological grounds. There are good reasons. It didn't even say you had to always grant them, they just had to have this process. And then it looked at the UK law and it said, I don't think the way UK law works at the moment has given enough procedural protections. This caused quite a lot of criticism in the United Kingdom. It returned back to the United Kingdom Court of Appeal in Attorney General Reference Number 3 in the um, um, find case there, McLaughlin and Newell case, where the Court of Appeal kind of reinterpreted guidelines in line to what the European Court of Human Rights had hinted at, and then happily concluded that when interpreted and read in this way, that all the concerns of the European Court of Human Rights in Vinter had been met, and so therefore it wasn't contrary to the European Court of Human Rights. So that looks quite almost antagonistic pushback, but it did give justifications and reasons for why it reached that conclusion. You then get the final stage in the story Hutchinson and the United Kingdom, where the European Court of Human Rights refers back to the re-reading of the English law that you find in the Court of Appeal decision and happily concludes that yes, actually now the UK law is in line with the European Convention of Human Rights and life sentences with our particular procedural protections are compatible with the provisions of the Convention. So there are ways in which even antagonistic dialogue can achieve some of what we want, but it doesn't necessarily give us some of the other aspects of pressure valve function necessarily working. It's more or a kind of happy, lovely chat over a cup of tea perception of dialogue. But sometimes this antagonistic dialogue can nevertheless achieve some of these advantages. Thank you very much.